Good evening. I'm Mark Bunting. Thank you for joining us on Market Call tonight. If you want to get in contact with Stephen, you can call us toll free at 1 877 667 6288 in Toronto. Dial direct at 416 957 8199. And you can contact Stephen through email as well, marketcall at bnn.ca. Welcome back, Stephen. Thank you for nice having me. Nice to see you. Looking good as always. I try. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, we've, it looks like uh, the, the Greece situation has been sort of uh, quieted down for the time being. But one would think that these uh, sovereign issues will continue to rear their head here uh, and there. How do you reconcile that part of what's going on uh, in the marketplace with the fact that earnings are getting better? We're seeing better uh, manufacturing data out of the U.S., for example, today. How do you reconcile those two? Well, I think that, you know, they're really two different issues. And to reconcile them um, might be frustrating to an investor. So what I try to do is say, okay, um, if there's a Greek situation, what will it mean for my Canadian domestic investors? So are they in good quality Canadian bonds? Yes or no. Are they in good quality Canadian stocks? Yes or no. Do they have good quality U.S. stocks? Do they have good quality U.S. bonds? And if they do and they're invested for the long term, then it might be a buying opportunity on some of these emotional dips that um, I think um, will take place from time to time. So the word we hear every now and then is, uh, is decoupling. Uh, do you think the North American economy could decouple to a degree from what's happening in Europe, especially if things uh, get worse over there? Oh, definitely. I mean, I, I, everything is interconnected. So if they fall off a cliff, we're in trouble. But if they trip and scrape their knee for, you know, a, a couple of quarters, um, I think we'll be just fine. Uh, in Canada, we've decoupled from the United States quite fine for the last 12 months, and, and we might um, decouple from them for another 12. Same with places like Australia and some places in Asia. So as long as there's not a massive, massive, massive breakdown in the uh, financial sectors over there, I, I think we'll be fine. And what's your impression of uh, interest rates? Uh, they're going to go up at some point, but do you think they'll go up just kind of incrementally and slowly? It won't be a, it won't be a drastic move. And, and what does that mean for stocks? Well, I think a, a gradual increase in interest rates means things are gradually getting better. And that is gradually good for stocks. So if there's a big snap, then, then stocks are going to get hammered. But if there's a quarter here and a quarter there, and it's measured and it's tempered, and I, and I think um, uh, Governor Carney's got a great handle on things. I mean, if things are done in that fashion, then I think that uh, we'll be okay in, in, in all markets. Because right now, money is free, and, and money can't be free forever. And so I don't really think there's a problem if, uh, if uh, interest rates go up a percent over the next year. And what are you doing specifically right now for your, for your clients? What's your big theme? My big theme is really positioning for the long term. So taking a look at what got knocked down, what has stood up quickly, and what is in good shape to move forward over the next two to five years. And if I can get some really good buys, I mean, even though my top picks are all Canadian stocks right now, it's just because I like those. Um, there may be some great opportunities to buy companies now that um, the Canadian dollar and the U.S. dollar are, are at par. So if there's some good long-term buys, we might um, dabble some more in, in U.S. companies for my clients. All right, Stephen, you're talking North American large caps tonight. We've got uh, phone calls and emails all lined up for you. And we'll be back on Market Call tonight right after this. Okay, we're going to go to uh, Mississauga and talk to uh, Manas. Hi there. Uh, hi. Uh, thanks for taking my call. Sure. Uh, my question is regarding uh, the credit card company like MasterCard or Visa, which one is good? I know that this is not a right time because tomorrow morning is MasterCard uh, giving a Q1 result. But out of these two, which one is better? My preference is MasterCard. So how do you think for the long-term and short-term perspective? Thanks. Okay, thanks for that call. 
Um, you know, both are companies that um, I own a small percentage of um, across my client portfolios. Um, I think that they are um, well-run companies. The, the, the risk here is I don't think so much in Canada, but um, the, the credit uh, situation in the United States, and um, it might spill over in, with this uh, new European crisis. What I, 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 I think that, you know, back in um, the, the, the dips when the stocks hit their lows, um, probably um, near the end of 08, the beginning of 09, that was a great buying opportunity. But um, if you look at Visa and MasterCard, both of them have been on a fantastic run. So long term, they're great, 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 great companies because what else is there? And it's really Visa, MasterCard, and then um, for some people who have access, American Express. So I, I, I like it as a core position. I don't know if, if you're going to make much money buying it right here at these levels for the next 12 months, but um, they're, they're two well-run businesses, and the near-term risk is, is definitely the default. I'm seeing, uh, Stephen, a Visa outperforming MasterCard fairly substantially in the last, let's say, year or so. Is there a reason for that? Should they um, not be moving in lockstep? Well, I think that uh, Visa is definitely the company that um, has more um, widespread use. I think uh, MasterCard um, does lag behind them in terms of their access. And um, I'm thinking that if... If I had to buy um, one of the two companies, I would, would, would choose Visa, but I don't think you can go wrong with owning MasterCard as well. All right, Stephen, an email now. This is from Jim on a very popular Canadian comp company. Uh, viewers love to know about RIM, Research in Motion. What do you think of RIM as a pick for the next uh, six months to two years? That's from Jim. Well, RIM is one of those companies that um, it, it, it's become a, a Canadian um, favorite, and if you've bought it up way up at the highs, I don't know if you'll get your money back. Um, maybe you will, maybe you won't. Um, but um, at these levels, it does look attractive. And, you know, what we kind of have to focus on here is uh, they're launching a new um, uh, handset technology that should be coming out in the next little while. And, and in this space where there's the iPhone and there's a BlackBerry, I think there's more than enough revenue for both of these companies to coexist. Um, so short term, I think that, you know, if you own it for another four weeks, you, you, could, you could definitely see it drop from here. But um, two years out, I definitely think that um, you would have uh, made some good money. So you're not concerned about uh, diminishing market share or uh, uh, lower margins for this company? Um, I think they still have room to increase their market share. Where, where, where I want to see is not the technology that RIM is dealing with in the next 6 to, to 12 months. That's not really the, the key for RIM because their revenues are, are pretty much guaranteed based upon orders and and, and new product delivery commitments and so on and so forth. But um, who knows what the next technology is with, with this stuff. Maybe, maybe you'll just think and something will be able to write it down. And, and I want to know, will RIM be, be in the lead of that space? And that's where I have a con concern for technology companies in general. Mm -hmm. But for the next uh, 6 to 12 months, I think the, the uh, caller or the email um, is, is in a good position in a good space by, by, by buying RIM at these levels. I remember somebody saying that the uh, technology leader 10 years ago is rarely the technology leader of today. Somebody usually leapfrogs them, and, and that, I guess that could happen to RIM, or maybe not. Well, I mean, it, it definitely could. I mean, it happened to Apple. Apple was almost gone. The question is, you know, when you're down and on, and on your back, is Bolsilli stubborn enough just, just to dig in and, and, and find something else that the world really needs? And, and right now, I think he's that type of man, and I, I think that um, RIM uh, definitely would be a company that I wouldn't have a problem with. And we know he's uh, stubborn when it comes to trying to get a hockey team, but <laughs> that didn't work out so well for him. All right, a quick break now with Stephen Conville. He's uh, taking calls and emails on North American large caps, so come on back on Market Call tonight.
Let's go to London, Ontario to talk to Ryan. Good evening. Oh, hi, guys. Thanks for taking my call. Um, my sure. question is in regards to Berkshire Hathaway, the B stock. I've been following this for some time now, and I know it split uh, a few months back. And seeing as though we're coming right off the uh, Omaha meeting, I was wondering if uh, this would be a good time to purchase Berkshire Hathaway B shares. You know, the Canadian dollar being almost at par now, is this a good way to get some U.S. exposure in my portfolio with one equity name? Thanks a lot for taking my call. Thanks, Ryan. Okay, so uh, Ryan, I'm 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 not a big fan of one equity name. That's that's something that um, I will beat the drum on, you know, till the last day they have me on this show. <laughs> one equity name is just is just not a good thing, in my opinion. Um, but if this is if this is put with several equity names, um, I think that you know you can't go wrong. It's not my favorite stock because I feel that Warren Buffett gets a gets a premium on um, the net asset value of the underlying companies that make up um, his, his 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 Berkshire A and B stock and I and I and I'm also concerned about his ability to live forever now if you're telling me that him and Charlie can live forever then I will tell you that go ahead and, and buy this but I just think that there may be better buys in in the United States. Now, if you're looking for the diversification because you're just going to buy one stock, and if you're hell-bent on buying just one stock, then this is not a bad one because it's internally diversified. Right. See, so it's a big, uh, not necessarily, I guess kind of a conglomerate. He owns so many, they own so many different kinds of businesses yes. from shoemakers to brickmakers and all kinds of different things. Okay, uh, we're going to talk to uh, Michael now in Toronto. Hi, Michael. Um, uh, Steve, if I can get your opinion on uh, Royal Bank and um, uh, possible price target, thanks, and I'll listen to your response. Okay. Okay, so my, my short-term um, price target for Royal Bank, um, you know, may be a little bit lower, um, it, it, just, just because, uh, you know, the banks in general have been on such a great run and um, their earnings growth may be slowed a little bit by them making some key acquisitions um i think you know uh in the united states you know they have an opportunity now with their great balance sheet to be able to pick and choose the best assets that are available south of the border so as a near-term play you might suffer a few dollars a share in retracement but for a long-term buy I, I i don't feel there's too many companies in the world that are better run i uh I, it's a core holding across uh, my portfolio, and um, I, I don't think, um, you know, three and five years out, there's a problem with you buying Royal Bank. So, Stephen, when you've seen Royal Bank, as we just saw on the chart there, hitting all-time highs uh, above those 2007 highs lately, have you been paring back uh, your investments a little bit, taking some profits, or you're, you're comfortable just uh, sticking with it? Well, when we went in and bought uh, near the lows, um, you know, I have uh, I've, I've essentially gone to half weight, so I've sold 50% um, of the, the position um, and, and taken that off the table. And that 50% that I'm holding, like, I mean, if I were to get a double from here, I'd probably do it again. Mm -hmm. But um, right now, I'm going to let that ride, and I'm quite content to have the money that I still have in, in the banking sector um, I, if it drops 10, 15 percent from here, I'm not I'm not concerned because they're well run companies. And I know that um, if you hang on to them, you're going to be rewarded in the future, especially knowing um, them picking up the gems um, from 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 the United States uh, brethren. Still with banks, uh, we're going to be uh, talking about one that's uh, overseas over in the UK specifically. This is a call from Brian in Edmonton. Hi, Brian. Hello. It's, um, I appreciate your show. Uh, I'm wondering how Lloyd's Bank may be affected by Greece and Portugal, one, and uh, what's their, uh, I'd like to see what uh, your comments are going forward. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Brian. Um, so, I mean, Lloyd's Bank is, is not a, a, a company that I personally would own um, in my portfolios, but it is one that is um, kind of become one of those buzz stocks, you know, uh, let's buy 
Lloyds Bank because of the uh, the opportunity for future growth because it's it's so beaten down. Yeah. Um, I mean, here, here here's the issue. Uh, everybody, to a certain extent, will be affected by what takes place in Greece. However, um, the fact that the uh, the financial package has been ratified, and I think it's the 110 billion um, that will be flowing there, a portion of it's from from uh, the EU, and a portion of it is from um, um, the IMF. Um, as long as that stabilizes, you shouldn't see. Um, too much chaos in Lloyd's Bank price. Now, if Portugal has to go through this and then Italy has to go through this, um, you know, I think we're really going to see some um, jitters in, 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 in the European financial services space. And therefore, when you're buying a Lloyd's Bank at these prices, what you're doing is, is, is you're, you're not quite gambling, but you're, you're betting that the, the worst days are are behind us because obviously the fall from four to zero is is not that far now uh, German banks hold the most um, uh, Greek bonds about 80 billion or so and apparently UK banks about 15 billion I'm not sure of that total if Lloyd's is in there but a uh, uh, good question there from uh, our previous caller Brian in Edmonton let's talk to uh, Dave out in uh, Kelowna BC hi Dave hi Michael Steven I own two or three preferred shares you know your power financial Great West and they've been hammered here the last two months, you know, down about one and a half, you know, two bucks just because the interest rates might go up. My question to you, have they been hit hard enough now that when the time does come, when the interest do start rising up, whatever, they're going to stay the same or they're going to keep going down then? Thank you. Okay. Uh, see, the, th the thing with preferred shares is, is it depends on the issue. So if you have one of those four and a quarter issues, because they're perpetual, so it's, so it's hard for me to assess the caller's question accurately. If you have the, the series right where, um, you know, at the lows of the market, when all of these financial institutions were struggling to get capital and you've bought the six and a half percent preferreds or the seven and a quarter percent preferreds, then you're definitely fine. The issue that you may have is, is if you've got the, the Great West Life four and a halfs or um, 4.75s, well, you know, those are going to come under a little more pressure at these times because the market wants to be compensated for um, the difference between the interest rate and the yield that they're getting on the PREF. Um, overall, I do hold a lot of preferred shares across the income side of my uh, portfolio, and I find that the Canadian Financial Services preferreds are a pretty solid, reliable way to get a tax-efficient um, dividend income into um, a portfolio. But you've got to be selective. You have to understand the relationship between the coupon and the PREF and the interest rate environment that you're in. And if you buy the wrong series at the wrong time, then it could be four or five years that you, you, you struggle underwater, but the, the dividend is always safe. All right, Stephen, uh, nice answer there on preferred shares. We're going to take a quick break. We're going to get uh, past picks from Stephen Conville after this.